There are those who, unfamiliar with the craft of dragon slaying, labour under the misunderstanding that simple strength is all that is required. While it is certainly true that strength is a great advantage, I, however, would contend that it is not alone enough. To be fair, there are very celebrated examples which have given rise to this misapprehension, the most famous of all, perhaps, being St. George, of course, who slew his Libyan dragon using only a lance and brute force. Or closer to home, Sir John Conyers, that celebrated medieval knight, who slew a dragon in the northeast of England using a falchion, a great single-edged sword. So celebrated was that feat of strength that the falchion was given into the charge of the bishops of Durham and has been in their charge ever since. However, for every Sir John Conyers there is a Beowulf. That Saxon dragon slayer slew his dragon, but at such a cost, the cost of his own life. For his sword and his strength gave out in the course of his battle with his dragon, and although with his final gasp he slew it, Using at close quarters a dagger, the flames and the venom of that beast were his unmaking. A sobering thought for all dragon slayers, and, I would contend, an indication that strength alone is not sufficient. Rather, a degree of native cunning is required. Native cunning, because a good dragon slayer will apply himself to understand where to find the dragon's weakness. Now, dragons are many and various, and in my studies I have come to the conclusion that there are no two dragons which are alike, but they do all have a weakness, be it physical or temperamental. Physical weaknesses can be exploited with a degree of ingenuity. For example, Sir Thomas Unsworth slew the Unsworth dragon by noticing that its weak spot was nowhere on its outer carapace, but its mouth were the soft parts when it gaped were exposed. And so he came up with a very devious plan, uh, got himself a musket, charged the musket, uh, and uh, packed it with gunpowder and such like things, but then also plugged a dagger into the end of the musket, took very careful aim, and then shot that dagger straight down the mouth, the gaping maw of the dragon, into its soft parts, thus slaying it from the inside out, so to speak. Very clever. The James Tiddle of Horndon in Essex slew his dragon by noticing that its eyesight could be bedazzled by glares and gleams, and so he made for himself highly polished armour which reflected the rays of the sun, and so bedazzled the dragon that he did not know up from down, and did not see Sir James when he approached and dispatched it. However, I would suggest that one consider very hard the temporal mental weaknesses of dragons, for they are very common to all dragons, and generally one of two kinds. Every dragon, I would suggest, is subjected to fits of blind rage, and almost every dragon, likewise, is uh, constrained by its greed. So, uh, for example, uh, Sir Peter Loshi and Lord Lambton, two separate knights living at different times in different parts of the world, both were able to take advantage of blind rage in the dragons whom they combated by concocting for themselves armour covered in spikes. That meant that when the dragon, following its natural instinct, seized them and squeezed them, it did itself injury without them having to be particularly strong. In these particular cases, I might add, the dragon was gifted with unnatural healing ability. And so both knights had to think very carefully about how they were to carry out their exploit. In the case of Lord Lambton, he chose to combat his dragon while uh, standing on a very small island in a fast-flowing river, which meant that every time a bit of the dragon dropped off, it would float down the river and be unable to reattach itself. On the other hand, uh, Sir Peter uh, decided that he would train his dog to snatch up each separate part of the dragon uh, and run away with it to a different part. And this was very successful in slaying the dragon. Unfortunately, 
A byproduct of it was the slaying of Sir Peter Loshy. Likewise, because when he greeted his dog, his dog was so excited that it leapt up and licked his master's face. And of course, the dog's tongue was covered in the venom of dragons, not clearly fatal to the dog, but fatal to Sir Peter, who died, alas. Greed, however, is very common amongst dragons and can be exploited without the need for swords or armour or spears or any such thing. So, uh, the dragon of Lymanster, for example, uh, was dispatched by the villagers uh, in the following way. They uh, cooked an enormous pudding, a uh, steamed pudding of such, such great density that when the dragon, following its greedy instinct, chomped down and swallowed it, it found itself unable to move and was easy prey for the villagers as they swooped down with sticks and staves and spears. And then finally the dragon of Filey in East Yorkshire. The dragon there was dispatched by a couple uh, who discovered that the ja dragon had a fondness for ginger parkin, a very, very sticky cake. Uh, and by getting it chomped down on a large portion of the same, glued its jaws firmly together, which rendered it effectively harmless, but also meant that the dragon sped off to the sea in order to sluice its mouth clean while it was washing itself in the briny deep, once again, the residents of Filey were able to approach it all unawares and dispatch it easily. So, if you take the advice of the Dragon Slayer, I tell you, swords and spears, most useful, strength, certainly valuable, armour, perhaps spiked, I would recommend, but always carry with you cake. Now, I am very aware that there has been little in the way of dragon activity for many a long year, and that the skills of a dragon slayer are perhaps not required. But you may rest assured that should there be signs of imminent dragon activity, uh, for example, uh, uncontrollable wildfires, or freakish weather events, or miasmas that spread mysterious diseases far and wide, then this dragon slayer, at least, will be ready to return to the fray.